Thank you for joining us. I appreciate it. It's a pleasure. I want to talk a lot about women and work and America because this is something that you have really recently been very outspoken about. Um, you say the flood of discussion about women and the workforce in this country recently has neglected one big thing. What is that? Well, I, I would say this, that, uh, that until recently, uh, structurally, women were held back. They still are to some degree. I mean, uh, they are not getting a totally 50-50 shake. But, but, you know, for 150 years after we said all men are created equal, <laughs> we, we treated women, you know, as, as, uh, as totally second-class citizens, and so we ignored all this talent. Uh, that's getting corrected to a degree, although there's, there's a ways to go on that. And then the second problem is, is, is uh, whether women believed it when they sort of got uh, what I would call brainwashed. And, and uh, I use the example of Catherine, Catherine Graham. Graham, who was an incredible person, bright as all get out. The first female CEO of a Fortune 500 Absolutely. company, the Washington and Post company. Sure, and, and, and in all kinds of ways, you know, a top-notch individual. And, but she had been told by a mother, by a, a husband, by the whole world that women couldn't do as well in business, you know, as, as, as men. And uh, I, I, I said she saw herself in a funhouse mirror that others presented in front of her. And, and uh, uh, as successful as she was, she never totally got over it. I mean, never? It, it, no, it, it, it shows how strong, you know, a, a message can be. Uh, you know, the message, my, the message my sisters heard that, you know, they didn't hear it verbally. They just heard it through all kinds of, of uh, actions of people that they didn't have the same future I had. Well, so it's interesting because you saw this play out in your own family. Sure. You had two sisters who you say that your floor was their ceiling. Mm -hmm. no. Was that parenting was that society it, it was a it was society but but it came through parenting it came through their teachers in every way they were told that you know sort of the best thing was if they married well and i was told that uh, you know that everything in the world was available to me if i had been i was born in 1930 if i had exactly the same wiring i have but i'd been a female my life would have been entirely different you know be candid with me here on this you're saying this now at 82 years old. Yeah, right. When did you realize this, and why are you speaking out about it now? Because if you saw it happening with your sisters yeah. back then, did you just think, well, that's the, that's the norm? Well, for a long time. Uh, I don't know whether maybe, well, I think maybe even in my 30s. I mean, uh, for one thing, I had a daughter that was terrific, <laughs> and it's all kinds of potential for her, and I had a wife that was terrific. Uh, but I have talked about, I have, I have 40 university and colleges that send out groups. Uh, mm -hmm. And I've talked about it with them for many, many years. And I don't know what inspired, well, I, I, read, I read Sheryl Sandberg's book and I, I, I just sat down and wrote a foreword to it. I sent it to her for one reason or another, it didn't exactly fit there, but I decided if that was a message that was, sh should get out, then why not put it out myself? So it was this lean-in movement, Sheryl Sandberg, Marissa Meyer of Yahoo, becoming CEO as she's pregnant and talking, talking openly about that. We are seeing this renewed discussion about the role of women. Uh, and, and you make the, the business case, not surprising, you're a businessman, exactly. that women are the major reason the U.S. will do so well. Why do you think that is? Well, look at what we've accomplished using 50% of our talent. So just imagine if we use 100%. But just we've used more than 50. I mean, I have a job. Yeah, well, no, no, I, but I'm going back uh, away right. for 150 years. I mean, you, you could have been a secretary, a nurse, a retail clerk, but you could not have been, a, you probably couldn't have been a lawyer, you probably couldn't have been a doctor, you probably couldn't have you know, become a partner in an investment mm -hmm. firm or anything of the sort. Uh, it, 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 those were just closed, and, and nobody really thought too much about it, apparently. I mean, you know, we didn't pass the, uh, the 19th Amendment until 1920, and even then, you know, it, it would, we had 33 justices appointed to the Supreme Court <laughs> before, uh, you know, we finally got to a female. So I wonder if your message is more for women or more for men? It's for both. It's for both. I, uh, men should realize that... You know, there's this. In, well, if if they had if they had male workers, and those workers could accomplish more if they had more education or whatever it might mm -hmm. be, they'd jump on that in a second. And to take half the people and 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 not recognize that they have just as much potential as the others and and use them 
is a big mistake. But it's for both. It's, it's for women to throw away the funhouse mirror and start seeing themselves in a real mirror. And I think many, a, a great many do. That, that has changed a good bit over the years. But I don't, I, there's room to go. But you've also said that um, one of the greatest enemies of this change, you wrote this in your Fortune essay recently, may be the, quote, ingrained attitudes of people who just can't imagine a different world. Now, we see that play out in uh, places like Afghanistan, and we see that play out in different ways, I think, here, too, in the United States. Sure. How prevalent of a problem do you think that is in 2013? Well, I think it still exists. I think it, it's different in different professions. I mean, uh, uh, you know, if you get a, uh, probably maybe a majority, I'm not sure what the numbers are, of, of, of uh, women in, in, in law school or in medical school, I mean, that's a real change. When I went to business school at Columbia, mm -hmm. there was exactly one woman in the class. We're <laughs> seeing more women getting higher degrees than so, men in many fields. Sure. So, so it, it changes very fast there, but it, 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 it varies uh, by profession, you know, by uh, maybe even you know, geographical regions for all I know. It, mm -hmm. it, it, but it is moving. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm glad to see that. Well, in my own case, when I teach these, when I have these college groups come out, university groups come out, I insist that one third of the group from every school be women. And if I hadn't insisted on that, I, I saw what was happening initially, and I don't know whether it was 90% or 95% men if I, if I asked you know, a variety of big schools to come out. So I just said one third women and it changed it. So you insist on a quota? Well, I insist on at least one third women, yes. So what about in American business? Because if you look at the Fortune 500 companies, less than 20 have female CEOs, less than 20. Yeah. Um, it, is corporate America losing out big time? Well, it, it's a mistake not to use all the talent. We have one woman at Berkshire Hathaway that is now chairman of, of four companies, mm -hmm. uh, but that's all new, and, and uh, she's doing a terrific job. Uh, uh, it, it comes slowly, and partly that's just, there's just a mindset that's different. At Berkshire, we have 13 directors. The six over 80 are all men. The six under 60 are half women and half men. I mean, they're the future. So as you've been more outspoken about women and the workforce, there are, are some that have come back at you and said, what about Berkshire Hathaway? You've got 70 plus companies and you have five female CEOs and only three of your 13 board members are women. Yeah, they but, think, should change be happening at Berkshire? Should well, you be doing this? Change is happening at Berkshire. And in the, in the last five directors that have been appointed, three are women. And, and I really look at the ones under 60 as being the board of the future. We're not going to throw anybody off the board that's in their 80s, but, but half, half of the younger members are women. And in terms of, in, in terms of CEOs, uh, uh, I have probably only appointed maybe six or seven CEOs because they come with the businesses and they stay. We don't have a retirement age. So uh, I appointed a woman as, as CEO of Johns Manville recently. That's, that's sort of unusual in the building materials business, but she was, the, she, she was by far the best candidate. Mm -hmm. There is not a diversity policy at Berkshire no, Hathaway. No. Why is that? Well, because there, there are very few policies that uh, we run probably the most decentralized operation. I know it's the, the most decentralized operation of any really large company. So our, our managers run their companies. And we have 24 people at headquarters. We have 280-some thousand working out in the field. So I, I convey some views through op-ed pieces or whatever it mm -hmm. may be. I don't, make, I, don't tell, I don't tell our managers how to run their business. And uh, if there's a new CEO needed, I make that decision. But that's, that's very rare. When there is a new CEO needed or a new board member, do you look specifically more at women to see if there's a woman of equal caliber to take the job to have that diversity? And probably. I'm going to pick the best person at the end. Right. But if there, if there are two that are nine on a scale of ten and one's a woman, she, she's probably going to get the job. Was there a shift when that happened that you started doing that? Uh, I didn't. I never really appointed that many. If you go back over the years, I mean, I have not made that many choices on CEOs. We we bought the Pampered Chef, which had a woman running it when we yep. when we bought it. Now it has a different woman running it. Uh, uh, but we put in a at Helsberg's, uh We put in the first woman CEO. I put in the first woman CEO. We had a John's Manville, the same thing. Mm -hmm. So. But there, there haven't really been a lot of changes in our managers over the years, and there won't be. Uh, mm -hmm. But there will be some. When you look at succession, everyone always asks yeah. you, who will succeed yeah. you eventually at Berkshire Hathaway? Not many people know. You have a list, uh, uh, and 
I know that you said there's three candidates and they're all men. They are all men. Have you considered a woman for the post? Well, I would, I would consider one, but, but they are all men. You talk to the CEOs of the biggest corporations around the world, and I'm wondering what your take is on their position on women in the workforce right now. What do they say to you? Do they seem very committed to wanting to see more equality in the workplace? Well, I think some are, and I think, it's, I think there's change going on, but it's fairly s slow, and, and that's one reason I wrote the op-ed piece. Are there any examples of people that you think um, are very progressive in this? Well, I think there are, but I, I wouldn't like to pick out names because I might, I might exclude somebody that is. And, and we have investments in a number of companies, certain of those companies, I think. Uh, I'm not talking about ones we, we control. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think certain of those companies, the, the CEO has a strong commitment. So some are, but some aren't. I think that's true. So talking about the education of girls, this is such an important thing starting at a very young age. Um, make the economic argument for the value of investing in girls' education. I know it's something that your daughter Susie focuses on in her philanthropy right here in Omaha, but not just in the United States, but around the world in places like Afghanistan. Yeah. Well, to some extent, well certainly through the Gates Foundation, we're doing significant things on that, and, and, and actually the foundations run by my children to some extent have, have gotten into that. No, I, I, it, it, the world existed in this, in this crazy system of second-class citizenship for women, you know, for thousands of years in all kinds of societies, different religions. I mean, religion reinforced it. Uh, so it, mm. it, you know, and here we write the Declaration of Independence, and then the Constitution contradicts it. I mean, <laughs> it says all men are created equal in the Declaration of Independence. The Constitution, on Article 2 on the President, uses male pronouns straight through it. So mm -hmm. it's amazing. Uh, uh, I think if I'd been born a female, I'd have been very unhappy about it. <laughs> what is the economic argument for investing in women's education? First, well, first here in America. The economic argu argument for investing in education generally is to enable people to rise to their potential. I mean, anybody that doesn't get a chance to fulfill their potential, you know, is being shortchanged. And when they're shortchanged, the country's shortchanged, too. I mean, if, if, if we were only educating people through the eighth grade, we'll say, in, mm -hmm. in this country for some reason, you know, it, they would suffer, America would suffer in a huge way. Uh, you, can't, you can't leave lots of people below their potential and reach your potential as a country. On the question of investing in girls' education around the world, um, how important is it, and does it pay off? Well, it, it pays off for society to enable anybody to come close to their potential. I mean, uh, uh, just think of the, the great people that have existed, you know, throughout our own country's lifetime, and and if they'd been held back in any way, it would have been a great loss to the country. So we want everybody to find their potential. Uh, you know, that's a goal we'll never reach, but, but it, it, striving toward it is, 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 is very important. It's important in the United States and it's important in the world. We, we can't influence that to any great degree in many countries. Now, I, you know, I believe in women's reproductive freedom because I don't think a woman has a chance to, or many women would not have a chance to reach the potential that they would want to reach unless they do have reproductive freedom. So we support that big time uh, around the world. and. Uh, uh, I think that's a terrific investment, uh, and it, I think it frees millions and millions of women to, to have, more have more control over their destiny than they, they would otherwise have. Your son Peter has called girls the most marginalized people in the world, and yep. he spends a lot of time overseas uh, working on girls and, he and, and education. He and his wife both, Peter and, and Jennifer, Jennifer both, yeah, absolutely. Uh, do you agree with him that girls are the most marginalized group in the world? I don't, it depends on how you would define it. I mean, I certainly... Uh, you know, racial things marginalize people too, and, mm -hmm. and many, so I. But certainly, I mean, just in terms of numbers, you know, it, it, obviously it's true. And and I really I, I feel terrific about the fact that Peter and Jennifer you know are focusing on that area. You know, it's interesting. You've said that your daughter Susie is the model for what you hope all women will be. What Absolutely. Do you, what do you mean by that? <laughs> well, I, I she does not see herself in a funhouse mirror. She she she's, you know she sees herself. Uh, as what she is, you know, she has she has real she has organizational ability. She's smart. She's energetic, and and she puts her passions to work in a, in a foundation that she works on for young children. Uh, it never crosses her mind that she can't do something because she's a woman. What do you attribute that to? 
Well, I, I, her mother, probably, <laughs> in a big degree, probably to me, in a, 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 you know, I believed in her. People need, you know, that unconditional love is the most powerful force in the world. And, mm -hmm. and having somebody believe in you, my, my dad particularly believed in me. He believed in my, my sisters, too. He just had been conditioned in a, in, in a way that he didn't, he didn't see himself, he didn't see them in the same position as he saw me. And I, it, it, it wasn't anything conscious. He loved them just as much. It just didn't cross his mind. Did you consciously make the choice raising two sons and a daughter not to do that? Well, I, yeah, I, I, I don't know whether how, how, exactly how to describe consciously doing it, but it was certainly my wife and I agreed 100% on it that, that all our kids should have equally op, equal opportunities. When I set up foundations for uh, each of the three, they were all in equal amounts. They all had full authority over what they did with those foundations. Uh, I do not see my sons and my daughter in, through different eyes. I think one really important part of this discussion is that there have been some that say the rise of women means the downfall of men. Oh, that's crazy. You know, I mean, that's, that's, that's uh, like saying if you educate more people, <laughs> you know, it hurts the ones that are already educated or something of the sort. It, uh, I, you know, let's just assume that for some reason we decided that men under five foot ten or whatever the number might be, some median number, should only have a few types of jobs, and men over that uh, height should, you know, have everything open to them. Is, is the society going to be better off if you make that kind of an arbitrary decision? It's just crazy to let any human uh, operate below their potential when, just by changing the rules a little, you can, you can, you can give them a better chance to meet their potential.